Hello everybody and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to talk about the A-level syllabus for animation. We will be working in Adobe Animate. If you're looking for a cheap alternative, I highly recommend OpenTunes, which is completely free and open source. But this video is about Adobe Animate. This checklist is based on the syllabus 9626 for 2022, 2023 and 2024. If you are watching this from the future, for example, 2025, probably the animation syllabus won't have changed much. So this video is probably still useful for you. However, you'd better go and double check the syllabus yourself or ask your teacher to make sure that there's nothing, that there's no ugly surprises on the exam. In this video, we are just going to go over each of these skills and I'm going to show you how to perform them. But remember, just knowing how to perform each of these skills in isolation is not enough for you to pass your exam and you need practice. So I'm going to provide some practice exercises for you, which you can find in the link in the description. And if you uh, are ready for past papers, then I recommend that you have a look at Ms. Finz's YouTube channel, who walks through the solutions of a lot of IT past papers. I separated it into two parts, the skills parts, which is basically what we have to be able to do for the practical exam paper four. And there's also the knowledge and understanding part, which also might show up on paper three. Okay, let's get started. I'm just going to start up Adobe Animate and I'm going to go to File, New. And when I go to File, New, I can see I can already pick uh, the stage. And I already have the width and the height and also the frame rate. We also have action script and HTML. Don't worry about what this means. It's not really relevant for us. We also have up here different templates. Let's just leave it on character animation. Anyway, after picking the width and the height you need, we're going to click on create. We have a stage in the middle. We have a timeline down here. We have a toolbar and we have a property bar as well as this header. If you don't see any of these things, you can easily make them appear by clicking on Window, Edit Bar, Timeline Tools, Property. These are what I have open right now. We can also open any of these, but we won't be uh, looking at most of them. Okay, here we have, for example, a Property Bar. It might be interesting to know that you can click and drag it and have it float above the canvas, or the stage, as we call it. Uh, if you don't like it floating above, you can just click and drag it, and you see this blue line appears, and we can put it back on the edge of the canvas. The same is true for the timeline and all that. Now, let's have a look, quick look at the checklist. First of all, we can change We've already shown how we can change the size of the canvas or start this, a new project and set the size. Let's have a look how we can change it and also let's ha have a look at the color and the aspect ratio. So if I look in the properties bar when I have nothing selected, I just click somewhere on the canvas and look at the property bar. I have dock over here and we can see that here we can change the width and the height. There's a little lock. If I lock it, it's going to keep the aspect ratio constant. Remember, the aspect ratio is simply the ratio between the width and the height. So if I increase the width while, the, while it's locked, the height is also going to increase. Or I can decrease the width, then the width is also going, then the height is also going to decrease. But if I don't have it locked, it's going to change independent of each other. I can also change the FPS down here, and I can change the col background color, the color of the stage, in other words. But I'm going to leave it as white. I'm going to press Escape. 
Another way to get there is just to right click on the stage or outside of the stage and click on document. And you will see here is another place where we can change the width, the height and the frames per second. So that basically covers that. Next, let's talk about rulers, guides and modifying grid settings. If we go to view, we can go to rulers. And as you see, these two rulers, which show the number of pixels, appear the coordinates on the stage. These are rulers. If I click on the ruler and drag, I can make a horizontal ruler or I can make a vertical ruler. I can double click on it to give the precise location. So for example, I want this one at exactly 25 pixels from the left hand side and this one too. Let's say I wanted exactly 25 pixels from the top. In case you don't like working in pixels, you can also do centimeters or inches or whatever you prefer. I'm going to stick to pixels. These guides, as you can imagine, can be very useful. We can also add a grid. Right click, grid, show grid. Once we show the grid, you can see uh, that there's a grid that appears here. And if you want to change the settings of this grid, right click, grid, edit grid. And I can change uh, the spacing of the grids. And I can also change the color of the grids. And here I can also show whether uh, to show the grid or not. Well, we also have snap to grid. We're going to be talking about that in just a little bit. Okay, that's that. Next, let's talk about set snapping options. Let's first go to edit, grid, edit, grid, and change the width to 100. The grid spacing to 100 just to be able to demonstrate what it means and i'm going to click on ok and now i'm going to draw a rectangle on my screen and i'm going to click and drag if i want to move this rectangle i can go to the selection tool i'm going to just select the whole rectangle and i can move it anywhere want. But if I right click, I can go to snapping. And I can go to edit snapping. And for example, I can make sure snap to grid is selected and snap to guides is selected. And make sure snap to objects is also selected. Or Let's not snap to objects. And click on OK. Snap to grid and snap to guide. And now when I click on the corner, it's going to, you see this little circle? I can snap to the grid. I can very easily, precisely set the location of this corner. And when I, because I, I also activated snap to guides, I can very precisely snap the location of these corner with respect to these guides. Oh, excuse me. If I, this snapping is very useful. Uh, if I click on, on the middle and move the middle, I'm sn snapping the middle of the object to the grid or I'm snapping the middle of the object to the guides or if I click close to the edge I'm snapping the middle of the edge to the grid or the middle of the edge to the guide
If I want to remove these snap settings, it's very easy. I just right click on the document and click on snap to grid snapping, snap to guides. And that explains setting snapping options, which covers the first part of the syllabus. Next, we're going to learn about import and create vector objects. Before we get started, is I have to show you something which is quite confusing, but can also be quite useful in Adobe Animate. That's the difference between... Okay, let's first click on this rectangle again. And now I've got the rectangle tool selected. And when I look at the properties, I see uh, all the properties of this tool. I can see the fill color, the stroke color, the stroke size, and the stroke style. So if I want to change the, rec the properties of the rectangle I'm going to draw, I can do it over here. One very confusing property of the tool is this object drawing mode. Right now I have object drawing mode active. It's a bit confusing because you can barely tell, but the hint is that the background of the button is the same color as this gray. This means that each object that I draw will be treated as an independent object. And I can later pick my selection tool and I can move the whole object and the two objects don't interfere with one another. However, let's use the exact same tool and deactivate object drawing mode. We can tell it's deactivated because of this dark background. The background is much darker than the background of the toolbar. Ignore this blue outline. It's just confusing. So when I click and drag now, and let me do a new shape. And I select it. First of all, it's only going to select the fill. And it's going to leave the border behind. Also, I can remove different parts. And I can change, I can give it a curve. And I'm cutting out a piece of the original shape. So the shapes interfere with each other. This drawing mode has its uses, but me, myself, I prefer to use object drawing mode. So I recommend you use object drawing mode from now on because it's a bit easier to understand. Okay, so now we have that out of the way. This tool, by the way, it's not only for the rectangle tool, but also for the brush tool. We also have to pay attention whether we're in object drawing mode or not. Now let's talk about vectors. As you can see, I have this shape and it has a stroke and it has a fill. Remember we have the selection tool and we can use the selection tool to move our object around. But we also have the sub-selection tool. And when we use the sub-selection tool, we will see not only uh, the whole shape, but we'll see different dots. This is what I call nodes, but Animate calls it anchors. In fact, let me just change the color of this rectangle so that we can see more clearly. When we have a shape selected in properties object, we can easily change the color and we're going to change the fill to something darker and also the stroke to something much darker. So we can see this blue dots, which are anchors. 
and lines connecting them. Using the sub selection tool, we can move the anchors around and we can change the shape. This is called vector drawing. And we can also use the pen tool to create a new object. For example, I'm going to create this triangle. And once I've created it, I can also use the sub selection tool to move the various nodes around. And we can also use a selection tool to curve these edges. We can use a pen tool again to add additional anchor nodes. And then after we've added them, we can use a sub selection tool to move them around. Another thing we can do using the pen tool is we can convert a curved anchor point into a straight anchor point, like so, or we can convert a straight anchor point into a curved one. Oh. like so. Using the pen tool, we can also move, excuse me, using the sub selection tool, we can also move these anchor, these uh, handles, which change the direction of the curved anchor points. If an anchor point does not yet have any of these anchor points that define the direction, that means it's a straight one. And we can convert it to a curved one using this tool. Just click and drag. And now that these anchor points have appeared, we can use a sub selection tool. to set them more precisely. This is all about vector drawing. So let's have go back to our checklist. We've learned how to create vector objects. We've learned how to control object properties. And we've learned about the stroke and the field settings. Next, next let's talk about tracing and adding bitmaps. To import a picture is very easy. I downloaded a simple JPEG picture and I just click and drag it to the canvas. And here we have the picture which was converted to a bitmap automatically. I can convert this to vector simply by going to the properties and object properties and click on trace. And here we have some settings. Uh, usually I just keep them as they are and I just click on OK. And here we have the uh, vector version. As you can see, it's split up into different vector shapes and we can easily use the sub selection tool or the selection tool to change the properties of our vector. And that's how we add and trace bitmaps. That's actually very easy, right? Next, let's talk about size, position, and orientation, and then transparency. So 
So I mentioned, uh, let's delete this to make my stage a little less messy. Let's start with size, position, and orientation. Over here, we have the free transform tool. We select any object we like, and we can easily click and move it around. When we select it, we have these rectangles, and these top ones uh, scale it vertically, while these side ones scale it horizontally, and these corner ones scale it in both directions. I can press control. Excuse me. I can always press Alt to change the center of scaling. And I can press, hold on, Shift to make sure that the aspect ratio stays constant. Over here, we can also rotate it. This dot also changes the center of scaling and rotation, by the way. And if I click on the edge, I can skew it. And if we click on the edge, we can skew it. Next, let's talk about the transparency. In the properties bar of the tool, we have transparency over here. Right now it's at 100%, but I can put it on 20%. And now when I create a new object, it's going to be partially transparent. Let's change the color. And as we can see, we have a transparent green rectangle now. Or if you've already drawn it and you want to change it, you just use the selection tool and you change the properties over here. Let's uh, make it 100% opaque after all. Same with the stroke. So that covers size, position, and orientation, as well as transparency. And that means we're done with this subchapter. Next up, we're going to talk about in-betweening. Okay, before we look at in between let's have a quick look at the timeline so far we've just been drawing stationary images down in the timeline we see a layer we'll talk more about layers later and we also see frames if you click on one frame and right click insert frame you will see that the previous frame just gets copied If I pick another frame and right click and click insert keyframe, we see that the previous frame gets copied, but now we can change the location. We can change something in this frame. And as you can see, we just have one constant frame until it jumps to a new const a new constant frame. In this example, we start with the two shapes in the top left hand corner, and it's constant for 14 frames, and then on the 15th frame it jumps, and then for another 15 frames it's constant again. So in this way, we can make a very simple animation. Just by moving these objects. manually. One useful thing is onion skinning. 
when I click on onion skinning, I can see not only what's happening in the current frame, but also what happened in the previous frames. You can onion skin not only in the past, but also you can you can also look in the future. And for now, that's all we need to know about the timeline. The example I just showed you is called frame by frame animation. That's because I'm drawing each frame individually. I'm just copying previous frames and then uh, drawing the next frame manually. But Adobe Animate gives us the option to have this framing done, having this animation done automatically. And this is what's called tweening. So to demonstrate it, first I'm going to just select all these frames and delete it. I'm going to select all of these frames by holding down shift and selecting right click. And I'm going to just choose cut frames and it's gone. So to demonstrate uh, tweening, we have two different kinds of tweens, which we need to know. We, we have motion tweens and we have shape tweens, which we're going to learn about. Let's start with motion tweens. For a motion tween, we just have to think about the initial drawing and the final drawing. Let's start with a simple oval. And after one second, right click and insert the frame. So now we have a one second duration. And during this duration, I want to insert a motion tween. So I'm going to write, so let's right click, click on create motion tween. And we get this uh, warning. We're just going to click on OK to ignore the warning. Now we're going to click up here. I'm going to go to our selection tool. We're going to go to our transform tool rather, and we're going to move the oval all the way to the other side. And as you can see, there's a blue line. And automatically, Adobe calculates each in between frame. We don't have to limit ourselves to only motion using the motion tween, but we can also increase the size and also the size will be automatically tweened. So automatically it's going from small to large. We can also, we can also rotate it and we can skew it. Let's rotate it some more to make it a bit more obvious what's happening. Quite useful, right? So I'm just going to delete this layer, make a new shape to show you about the transformation tween. Again, after one second, I want to insert a new frame because I want the whole animation to last one second. But now, previously, we inserted the motion tween first. But when it comes to a shape tween, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a blank keyframe. And I'm going to draw a completely different shape, a rectangle. And I'm also going to change the color of my rectangle to red. And let's also change the stroke to, I don't know what, green. Set the opacity to 100%. And change the style just to demonstrate. So now I have an initial frame over here. That's the shape before and the shape at the end of the animation. And in the duration between, I'm just let's just right click 
and select create shape tween. And now it automatically transforms from one shape to another. And that covers motion tweens as well as shape size and color. Okay, next, next let's talk about setting paths. Let's create a quick let's create a quick motion tween. Remember how there's this blue line which is uh, represents the path between that the pink takes? One easy way to give this a curve is just by using the selection tool. Hover over it until this curve appears and then we can give it a simple curve to change the path that the object takes. But we can give it a more advanced curve than that. Let's click on Ctrl Z, Ctrl Z, Ctrl Z. And instead of inserting, uh, creating a motion tween, let's create a classic tween. Okay. And now let's right click on the layer and go to add classic motion guide. And as you can see, we have a new layer appearing and uh, the classic tween is a child layer of the guide. We select the first frame and we're gonna go to pen tool and I'm going to draw the path. And let's make sure that we have snap to object selected. And let's go to the first frame of our circle layer, our layer one layer. And we're going to set the initial position over here. And then let's set the final position. Make sure it's still snapping to this line at the final position. And as you can see, it follows, the tween follows the path we have set for it. Let's change the properties of this path to remove the stroke. And that's all about set paths. Next, next let's talk about using layers. So far, we've been working on a single layer, but we can easily add multiple layers by clicking on the plus. And we can put different objects on different layers. We can move the Z depth of the layers, or we can move the layers to the foreground or to the background by clicking and dragging. We can also hide layers by clicking on this eye. And we can also lock layers by clicking on this padlock. And really, that's all there is to know about layers. Next, let's talk about masks. I've imported this background to demonstrate masks. Using a mask, we will be able to see what's behind the shape, and anything that's not behind the shape will become invisible. So the first thing we should do is add a new layer, and we're going to call it mask. And let's add the shape over shape. Put it right in the middle. 
Now we're going to right click on the mask and select mask. And as you can see, we can only see this part. The good thing about masks is we can animate them. So let's right click, insert frame to extend the duration of the animation. And let's do the same for the mask layer. And now we want to insert a motion tween, but we can't, unfortunately, because automatically it's locked. So we have to unlock the mask. And when we unlock the mask, we cannot see what uh, it's doing. So we need to unlock it and then apply the tween and then relock it to see the effect. So let's go to create motion tween. And let's focus now on animating this, uh, this oval. I want to start the oval really small. Move it to the left hand side. And then I want it to move into the thing and grow as well all in one second. So the mask is going to move like this. And now let's relock the layer to see what it's going to look like. Beautiful, right? Okay. That's it for applying masks. Finally, we're going to talk about controlling animations, adjusting the frame rate and deciding whether or not to loop the animation. Changing the frame rate we've already learned about before. Just select anywhere uh, where you're not selecting an object and right click and you let's go to document and here we can set the frame rate. Another thing we can do is when we export, go to file export export as an animated GIF. And here we can set looping. So we can either loop over and over and over again, or we can just do it once. And when we export like that, it's going to just do it once, but if we loop, it's going to go over and over and over and over. And that's all. So that brings us to the end of the video. I hope you learned something. Remember this video was just going over each skill one by one and explaining how to do them. But practically, in order to actually pass an exam, you need to get as much practice as possible. And for that, you can download uh, the exercises, which you can find in the link in the description. And you can also practice past papers. One really good channel for, for helping you, uh, if you get stuck practicing past papers, you can always have a look at Finn's papers, who is a pretty good at working for the solution of all these past papers. So good luck on your exam. That's it from me for now. Bye bye.